Around six million of the UK population live within one kilometre of the coast. But not every coastal property is made of bricks and mortar. Just as popular are homes of a more mobile nature. Some of the best views of this coastline are found on this magnificent stretch of the Great Western Railway as it slinks along the seafront towards Dawlish. Today, only a handful of coastal railways are left in Britain. This one flirts a little too dangerously with the sea at times, and now its existence is under real threat. Mark Horton is exploring the troubled life of this historic railway. The train line that connects Exeter to Plymouth is a vital commuter lifeline. But for a few weekends a year, there's a chance to experience the majestic views in style. The smoke in your eyes, the smell of the steam, this must be one of the most glorious railway journeys in the world. Of course, it was the first glimpse holidaymakers have of the sea as they go to the West Country, this wonderful view of the South Coast. But the genius behind this route was Isambard Kingdom Brunel, who in 1843 was commissioned to build the extension of the Great Western Railway down along the South Devon coast to Plymouth. On the face of it, this is a ridiculous place to build a railway line. Even on a calm day like today, passing trains are at risk of a soaking from waves crashing onto the seawall. So what made Brunel build his line here? To find out, I'm meeting railway historian Peter Kay. It was impossible to have a direct route because of the range of hills, and he had to choose between either coming right along the coast, as he did, or having a route right behind Dawlish and Timmer through very long tunnels. But surely, I mean, to build a railway here was an incredibly risky operation. The storms would have come in and smashed over his railway. I think uh, the local people tried to point that out to him. Uh, I know that there were several petitions to Parliament and the Exeter Corporation said the line would be a danger to Her Majesty's subjects <laughs> because of the risks from sudden storms. Uh, Brunel was convinced that there would be no problems caused by the sea to his railway because he was such a confident engineer. <laughs> Brunel's um, original route was several yards further out. He wanted to go round this headland on the outside without a tunnel here. Of course, had the line built further out, it would actually have been even more exposed to the <laughs> ravages of the sea. Fortunately, he was opposed by the local people who didn't want to lose their beach. This was the gentleman's bathing beach and would have been lost entirely had Brunel got his original route. So we had to build a system of tunnels through the cliffs? Yes, there was only one tunnel that intended originally, and he ended up with five. But it wasn't just the tunnels, but we seem to have this huge seawall, which was probably for about four miles from yes, one yeah. headland to the other. Yes, that was um, quite a substantial construction job. Stone came from Torbay by ship, it was landed on the beaches. This is a period of the great heroic era of Victorian engineering in which they thought they could go anywhere. One of Brunel's famous quotes was, nothing is impossible for an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> but Brunel's engineering bravado didn't always guarantee success. When the line opened in 1847, Brunel had taken the bold decision to use a new means of propulsion called the atmospheric system. Huge pumping houses, like this one at Star Cross, were constructed to create a vacuum in a pipe laid between the rails, which sucked the trains along. Although the system worked, it was just too expensive to maintain, so steam locomotives took over after just 12 months. So how has the railway fared since Brunel's time? Well, I'm afraid the pessimists were quickly proved right. This section that we're walking on now is uh, rebuilt totally in the 1860s. The real ongoing problem was that the seawall often got undermined by, by the waves. So it's not just the storm smashing against the wall, but the continual erosion at the base of the wall that's the It's problem. the base of the wall is the normal problem because the bedrock underneath the foundations is very poor stuff and the waves break it up and suck out the infill behind, make a hole in the bottom of the wall. 
and then the line collapses. I mean, now we've got to a global warming and sea level rises. I mean, are we actually going to lose the line for good in the next 50 years? Well, who knows? <laughs> who knows indeed? When Brunel built this line, he insisted that it would be no more expensive to maintain than any other stretch of railway. Nine million pounds has been spent since 2004 trying to shore up the line, prompting calls for replacement to be built in land. But such a line could never compete with the amazing coastal scenery that makes this one of Britain's most stunning railway journeys.